On March 9, 2020, my guest traveled 1,700 kilometers from the east coast of Canada to my studio in Kitchener, and we recorded a podcast where we discussed the debt traps of buying a business. Then a week later, the economy shut down and nobody was thinking of buying a business. But now, as we get used to the new reality of physical distancing and all the changes that will influence the economy for many years, two interesting trends have emerged. First, there are some people who will never go back to working in a standard office job or whose old job no longer exists, so they want to buy a business so they can support themselves. Second, at the exact opposite end of the spectrum, there are a lot of business owners who are thinking, uh-oh, the world will never be the same, I want to sell now and get out while I can. We live in interesting times for buyers and sellers. How can you decide on a reasonable price to pay for a business? We talk about it on today's show. Here's my conversation with David Barnett, recorded in March, and then at the end of the show, I've got David back on the line today, June 9th, 2020, to give us an update on what he's seeing with actual deals over the last month or two. How is the virus affecting the purchase and sale of businesses? We're going to find out. We do get into some of the nitty gritty of how to figure out how much you should pay for a business, so if you're thinking of becoming a business owner, this is the show for you. We discuss it for about 31 minutes, and then we'll be back with an update. So, to start it off, my first question was, who are you, and what do you do? Here's our conversation. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Hey, Doug. My name is uh, David Barnett, and I'm a private transaction advisor. I help people buy and sell small and medium-sized businesses. I'm a former business broker, and before that, I was a small business finance consultant, which meant that I brokered debt for small businesses that were trying to grow. And basically, I work with people one-on-one now, and I've written some books on the topic and uh, work with people all over the English-speaking world. And we will put links on our YouTube uh, channel to uh, all of your stuff. DavidCBarnett.com would be the best place to track all that stuff down. DavidCBarnett with two T's.com. So what is the profile then of your typical client? You just explained that I deal with people all over the world, so I realize there is no exact typical mm-hmm. client. But give me the, the rough profile in terms of size, industry, that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, the average person that I work with from the buying side is somebody who is employed and they don't like their job, and they've always felt like they should be an entrepreneur and they should have their own business, but they're typically getting into those middle years, they're in their late 30s, 40s, and now they have a mortgage, spouse, children, et cetera, and they realize that the time to sort of throw caution to the wind and start a new business from scratch has probably passed. They really do want to be a business owner, but they know that they can't deal with the risk of starting something. And so eventually they'll come across the notion of buying a business that's already running. So you buy this business, it's already profitable. You can write yourself a paycheck from day one. It eliminates the risk. But if the deal isn't done properly, you can create a whole slew of new risks for people. Okay, so I want to talk about this, you know, how you get into into trouble. And this is something that I see very often in my world. And it's exactly the way you described it. Um, And in, you know, my case and Ted Michaelis's case, we were working for a big accounting firm. This is 20 some years ago. And eh, we weren't really happy with how it was going. And so we said, you know what, we can do better. We're going to start our own. So that's a a pretty common uh, scenario. The other common scenario would be I'm working for a business and the owner says, well, it's time for me to start thinking about retirement. Do you want to buy the place? Okay. I already know the business. That would, that Mm -hmm. would make sense. I guess the other scenario would be perhaps it's a business that I use and I, I think about buying it. And so, okay, that all conceptually makes makes perfect sense. But obviously there are a whole lot of trouble, there's a whole lot of trouble that, that you can get into. So what I like to do is kind of walk through a, a case study. Sure. Which I'm just gonna make up off the top of my head because it's not a real case study. But um, there's this great restaurant that I always go to and I really love the food and the staff and everything's great. And, and I know the owner and the owner says, you know what, it's time for me to, to retire. Uh, do you wanna buy the place? Now, of course, I don't know anything about the restaurant business, but he says, oh, we got managers and staff and everything else. You know, why don't you buy it and and you can run it? So, okay, you know, that'd be kind of cool because I'm looking for something different to do. The first question in my mind would be how much? Right. So the owner says to me, well, it's going to be a million dollars. 
okay, so how do I know if that's a fair price or not? Because if I'm selling something, I'm going to tell you the highest possible price I can think of. That's how negotiating works. How do you go through the thought process of deciding what a business is worth? And, you know, full disclosure here, I'm a chartered business evaluator, so I understand that. And I also took courses for years and years and years. So to, to give a complete answer would take longer than we've got. But just give us the sure. overview then of how you come through, go, go through that decision making process. So small businesses are valued on a multiple of what's called seller's discretionary earnings. It's the total amount of cash flow available to an owner operator who works full time. And, and the reason why we use this level of cash flow is because that person who's buying a small or medium sized business is typically going to be taking over from a seller who is the manager of the business. And this buyer is typically going to come in and go work there full time and run, become the manager themselves. So they've got two different hats on. They have an investor hat on and they have a job seeker hat on. So the first thing we do is determine what that seller's discretionary cash flow is through a process called normalization. As you know, Doug, a lot of small business people will manage things in a certain way to reduce their tax burden. <laughs> yes, I've heard that. And yeah. so we'll go back and we'll remove things like, you know, the expense for the spouse's fuel bill or things that aren't actually related to the business's operations. And we'll get that true level of cash flow that is available to that owner. And then different industries uh, will have different levels of risk. And the level of risk in the industry will determine how much we multiply that cash flow by. So restaurants are typically risky business, so that multiple is gonna be quite low. And there are all kinds of risks in that number because a lot of the times we have to talk with the seller and they're gonna tell us stories about the different expenses on their income statement. And, and we don't know 100% for certain if those stories are accurate or not. So a typical restaurant, and you had would have more experience in this than I do, um, back in the day when I was doing corporate insolvency, uh, I don't do that anymore, I just deal with people now, but when I was doing corporate insolvency, our, the saying, the rule of thumb was, you wanna be the fifth buyer of the restaurant, okay? <laughs> so the first guy goes in and, and sets up a brand new restaurant, he, he spends all this money on new kitchen equipment, you know, leaseholds, tables, the whole bit, and can't make a go of it. The next guy comes in, buys it for a little less, the next guy, the next, it's the fifth guy where the landlord is like, look, I just need anybody in here, I've got all this equipment, you don't even have to pay for it. That's the guy who, who makes money. What is a typical restaurant's total revenue in a year? So I don't know, a restaurant that's got, I don't know, 50 tables or what, like whatever. A, a, a oh, you know, it, it can it can range. I mean, there's plenty of little mom and pop sandwich shops that are doing three, 400,000 in total revenue. And then there's a small chain restaurants, which might have 50 tables that could be doing one to 1.3 million in revenue. So let's say I'm a million dollar restaurant. Yep. Okay. And so as the seller, I tell you, well, it's three times revenue. Well, okay, that's ridiculous. No mm -hmm. one's gonna pay that. You're not gonna pay $3 million. That million dollars in a restaurant, obviously I'm paying for food, I'm paying for the, the staff, I'm paying for supplies, rent, whatnot. What would typical operating margins be then? So out of that million dollars, is there a couple hundred, and I'm not talking seller's discretionary yet, I'm mm -hmm. just talking, okay, what, what's the business making before all the, the funny stuff? What kind of margins do you typically see in a restaurant? Well, it, it, it's a great question. It actually depends by the, depends what type of restaurant it is. A place like an Italian pasta joint will have much better gross margins than a steakhouse, for example, hmm. because your cost of goods sold are going to be different. It, in general, the rule of thumb is, is that a business doing up to a million dollars in sales from zero to 20% of that top line can fall into the SDE. Once you get above a million dollars in sales, it's very difficult for that owner to get more than 10% out as the seller's discretionary earnings. And the reason for that is once you expand beyond a certain size, you need to start introducing certain levels of middle management. Mm -hmm. This is when you need a, a dining room manager and a kitchen manager that the owner operator just can't do it all himself. Gotcha. Anymore. So your margins, the revenue goes up, but the, the, the margins go down. So, okay. So the, the business is kicking off, let's say it's really well run. It's kicking off 20%, but then the owner is putting through a bunch of wacky expenses. Mm -hmm. He's putting through the, the lease for his kid's car and he's, you know, all these non-business related expenses. So what you're saying is we add those back yep. to come up with what a, a true, what the true income is of the business. We, we want to know what the true owner benefit is of owning that business. The true owner benefit. Okay. So let's say that this particular business, it's a hundred thousand bucks a year. Okay. So 
Now, you already talked multiples. So what would a typical multiple in that scenario be? So for a restaurant, it's a not a franchise chain or anything, an independent name. It, we could be looking at anywhere between 1.6 up to 2.3 times. So this restaurant could go for 160 to 230,000, let's say. And so if the owner wants a million bucks, then uh, that ain't going to happen. No. And this is where someone like you comes in and I guess you have to talk the guy down, like the, the purchaser, and say, yeah, I know it's a wonderful restaurant. The pasta is fantastic. It's in a great place, but it's not worth a million dollars. Right. Here's the thought process why I'm coming up with, with what it's worth. And I assume that's a big part of your job, probably. Yeah. So a lot of the times when I work with buyers, the the, the initial thing I'll do, um, you know, I do some training and seminars and things, but uh, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a client, I'll do a buyer insight analysis. And it's a quick rundown of all the material that's been provided by the seller or the seller's broker, if there is one. And I'll do some benchmarking with other industries. And even if I can come into a ballpark and say, this business is probably worth between 180 and 220 that's usually good enough for a buyer if the asking price is 450. Yep. Right. They now know that it's got to come down significantly in order for it to make sense. Yep. And without something to benchmark it against, how do you know? Well, that's why you bring in somebody who's actually seen this, you know, more than once in their in their life. Um, and and in that um, seller's discretionary earnings, are you factoring in things like uh, capex, taxes, all that sort of stuff? So this is this is one of the first traps that we need to talk about. So that seller's discretionary earnings is based upon a normalized EBITDA and then the owner or manager's fair market salary is added back to that. Okay, and so for the non-accountants, EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Right, so so, so real money. The, the reason why we're adding back depreciation and amortization is those are non-cash expenses, they're for tax purposes. However, you know, if you're gonna buy a little corner store that has you know, some shelving and things like this. I mean, those things can be depreciated and still run for a long time. If you're buying a business like a foundation contractor where you have a lot of heavy equipment and whatnot, well, now the depreciation is actually important. Because it wears because out a lot quicker. Those machines are wearing down, they need to be replaced. And so that seller's discretionary earnings, we're not factoring in taxes. We're not factoring in finance costs. We're not factoring in the replacement of stuff that's wearing out. And this is one of the places where people get into trouble because they'll take that SDE number and they'll overcommit that cash flow to debt service. And then if they end up with any kind of hiccup in the operation of the business, they'll get into trouble. And one of the things I love to point out to people is that businesses are asymmetrical systems. So if you have a business, let's use your million dollars of sales, and you're earning a profit of 100,000, instead of a restaurant, let's look at a different kind of business, let's say a trampoline park, okay? So most of your cost is, is the fixed cost, the facility, the huge rent bill that you have. If you have a 10% decline in sales in that kind of business, you may not be able to cut half of your costs out. You could end up with a $100,000 sales decline and an $80,000 decline in your profit. That's a 10% sales decline leading to an 80% profit yeah, decline. Yeah, which is kind of how a retail store works if they make all their sales at Christmas and Christmas right. is bad, you're wiped out. If Christmas is fantastic, you have a, a fantastic uh, run of it. So, so okay, many different, many different factors to consider there. Now, I want to talk about money. Okay and specifically debt. Mm -hmm. So so I hire you and we figure out that, yeah, this business is worth 250,000 bucks and the owner wants 400,000 and yeah, okay, maybe we agree to pay 300 because I really want it and okay, fine, you know. And, and uh, you would of course advise me on things like, well, the old owner better stick around for a year or two, otherwise he disappears, all the clients disappear and, and you don't have a business there. But now I gotta come up with the money to pay for it. Mm. So, and this is what gets my clients into a huge amount of trouble. I'm buying a business, so I go and borrow the money to buy the business, because that's how you do it, right? I don't have the money, I borrow it to do it. That's how I bought my car, that's how I bought my house, I guess I'll just do it the same. So I go off to the bank and say, hey, bank manager, will you give me 300,000? And he laughs and laughs and laughs. And says, no, I'm not gonna give you 300,000 for a business. I'm, I'm happy to give you a car loan because there's a car attached to right. it. I'm happy to give you a mortgage because if you don't pay, I can take the house. But if I lend against the business, I can't really take the business because the business is you know, a pasta making machine and tables and chairs, mm -hmm. and it's very hard for me to, to turn that into money. So number one, am I correct in saying that 
in the normal course, a bank is not going to lend you all the money to buy a business, or am I wrong? No, you're absolutely correct. And when <clears throat> when you go to have that conversation with the banker, the banker is going to say, what are you buying? And he won't accept business as an answer. He's going to want a list of stuff. Mm -hmm. Because in the banker's mind, he wants to know what are the machines, what are the tables and chairs. And in Canada, we have a, a government-sponsored small business lending program where they'll expand that to include things like leasehold improvements in a, in a rented location for a business. So the banker is going to look at the tangible value of the things that are within that business, and they may make a loan based on that. Yeah, and I know in our business here, we have a lot of computers. And so those are pretty easy to finance. I can phone up the leasing company and say, hey, I'm buying 30 computers. They go, no problem. Tell us the make serial numbers. Yep, here you go. Here's the check. Easy peasy to do. And I guess that's because it's a tangible thing. I guess mm -hmm. they figure, well, if we don't you know, pay us, we can get the machines back. But even if you don't pay us, at least there is something tangible there. It's a real thing, as opposed to paying for goodwill, which is right. a, a much more nebulous thing. Now, and so, but let's talk about goodwill, because if a business is profitable and a buyer wants to buy it to avoid the risk of starting a business, what people will bandy that word about all the time, goodwill, does a business have goodwill? And I think it's important for viewers to understand exactly what that word means. It simply is, the, the goodwill is simply the difference between the price you've agreed to pay for the business and the price of the tangible things. So in the case of our restaurant for 300,000, if there's $100,000 worth of furniture and equipment and things in there, then the goodwill in that transaction is 200,000. It's just the difference. And that is ethereal. Yeah. That's based upon Air. the relationships that the seller has with the good clients that come by. It's based upon the great family recipe he's been using for 30 years in his sauces, right? And as a buyer, if you go in there and you change the sauce recipe, you could lose half the clients overnight. And the banker understands this and they know just how fragile that goodwill is. Yeah, the goodwill is also a measure of risk. So if the business gets into trouble, well, I can sell all the equipment and get back 100,000, but if I paid 300, that 200 is air. Right. And, and I, can't, uh, I can't sell that. So obviously that's why they don't wanna finance air. Right. They wanna finance the tangible stuff. So the bank says, you're paying 300,000 for this restaurant, 100,000 of, of it is hard goods. Right. So we'll loan you 100,000. No. I, doesn't work that way. No. So so they're only going to lend up to a certain percentage of those hard asset values. And so, um, you know, the the guarantee program from the government says up to 90 percent. But in practice, if you're going to buy something like a restaurant, you'll be lucky to get 50 or 60 percent. So I'm buying this three hundred thousand dollar restaurant that has a hundred thousand mm -hmm. bucks worth of tables and chairs and equipment. I might be able to borrow 50,000. Right. I've still got to come up with two hundred and fifty thousand bucks. Right. And the bank is going to want to make sure that your opening balance sheet, so when you set up your new business, let's imagine this is an asset purchase, not a share deal. Mm -hmm. That's kind of complicated. But um, they want to see that you have some skin in the game. So they're going to want to see that there's a minimum debt to equity ratio. So they want you to have a certain amount of your own money that goes into this deal. And that can come from your own savings. It can be gifted in certain circumstances. Or it might come, for example, from your home equity if you have a line of credit against your house. So that sounds like a good answer then. I'm just going to get a $250,000 line of credit against my house, put it in the business, bing, bang, boom. Any problem with that theory? Yeah, there's a big problem with that, Doug. So while you may want to take your little down payment, say seventy five grand that you're going to put in towards this, you might want to take that against your house. You don't want to take the entire sum against your house because now what you've done is you've basically given the seller all of the money for what is essentially a highly risky asset and you've put up something which is pretty secure that you've worked hard for which is your home's equity to stand at risk if something goes wrong in the restaurant and if the seller believes that his restaurant is worth three hundred thousand then shouldn't the business be able to stand as collateral what, what would you think about a car dealer who said you should buy this car but we won't lend against it can't right? be a very good car would you then? worry about the quality of the car yeah Right. Absolutely. So what we need to do is we need to create a financing plan where we involve the seller so that we can make sure that all of the things you talked about, the goodwill, the relationships, the you know grandmother's sauce recipes, all that stuff is conveyed properly and it creates a mechanism for us to control risk. Don't forget that seller's discretionary earnings number that we've been using to value the business. Part of it was based upon what we were told about different expenses that the owner had put into the business. And so 
what we need to do is we actually need to get the seller to become part of the financing package. We need to borrow money from the seller to buy his business. And so how does that work in practice then? So, mm -hmm. I, so I, I'm gonna buy this $300,000 business. Mm -hmm. uh, the bank's gonna put in 50,000 right. against the equipment. Let's say I'm gonna put in, well, you know, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000, something like that. The bank wants to see that I've got some skin in the game as, right. skin, skin in the game as well. So I'm saying to the seller, you need to, in effect, put in 150, 200,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. And we all know this is a great business because you've told me it's a great business. We know it's going to be kicking off lots of cash. So here's the deal. I'm going to buy the business from you. I'm going to give you 150 up front, and then I'm going to give you X number of dollars for a period of time. Is that what That's we're talking exactly about? exactly right. So, so at the closing table, when you buy this business for 300,000, you're going to have lawyers there and everything. And the lawyer will have money from your amount of money that you put in and from the bank's money. And so the seller will get a check for 150,000 and a piece of paper called a promissory note. And that note will say that you owe him another 150,000 and it'll have all the terms outlined. You're gonna pay him X amount per month over so many years. There may be an interest rate attached to that. There could be all kinds of other features in that note. But one of the features that needs to be in that note is a clause that says this note is subject to offset in the case of a material misrepresentation or undisclosed liability. And so what that does is it holds the seller accountable for all of the stories and all the pieces of information that he told to us. If it turns out he was lying about something or something isn't quite as real as we thought, we now have the ability to make an adjustment in that purchase price after the fact by reducing the amount of that debt. Yeah, so he said it's doing a million dollars in revenue. It turns out it's only doing half a million dollars in revenue. Well, I'm not paying you the full amount. Or it turns out I haven't been paying my employees. Mm -hmm. They're owed all these back wages. They're owed you know, source deductions to the government or something. Well, and we're not going to get into the details of asset versus share purchases and all the rest of it. But OK, that would be another clawback on the, on the price. So as a seller, why would I agree to that? I mean, I, I'm selling my business because I want money. And what you're mm -hmm. saying is you're not actually giving me all the money. I'm going to get my money over time. Why would I agree to that? Well, quite well, for a, a bunch of different reasons. So number one, if the seller won't do a vendor financing, what eventually will happen is he'll come to realize that the buyers that come forward and make offers can't get the money, right? Mm -hmm. And so without an awareness of the seller financing strategy, what will eventually happen is the enthusiasm that seller has in the business will start to decline, performance will start to decline, price will decline to the point where it will meet its tangible asset value. And now there's no goodwill, right? right? I've seen this unfortunately happen several times to sellers. If sellers become aware of how you do this, you know what it allows them to do is actually achieve a proper price. A seller who demands all cash on closing, what's going to happen is buyers are going to want to discount the price to make themselves comfortable with all the what ifs. Yeah, and in this example, fine, I will pay cash one hundred and fifty thousand. Right. Or I will give you three hundred thousand, of which is one hundred and fifty is up front and one hundred and fifty is over time. And I guess you could even have a some kind of accelerator clause in there that says if the business does even better, well, I'll pay you a little bit more then. Well, you know, and and, and that's interesting because what often happens is these notes are open for prepayment, and sometimes people will make a deal where the, you know the seller really represents the fact that the business has all kinds of potential to grow. And so instead of paying a higher price based on those stories, what we can do is create some kind of participation where if certain targets are hit, certain extra amounts are added to the promissory notes or the inverse. If certain targets are missed, different amounts are deducted from the note. So it could be higher or lower. Yeah. Now, again, we're talking about debt here. And so I know in the personal finance world, there's these things called payday loans, which right. you've probably heard of. I assume they have them out east where, uh, where you are from. Oh, yes. Um, and they are very high interest and, and you know, we, we rally against them here. The same concept sort of exists for businesses. What, mm -hmm. are the, what do you call a payday loan for a business? It's called a merchant cash advance. Merchant cash advance. So walk me through the, the deal there. How does that work? So in a, in a merchant cash advance, a business owner who needs to get their hands on money uh, will, and oftentimes they're not even looking for it. These guys call these businesses all the time. They will purchase for a lump sum a percentage of your receivables moving forward until a certain amount has been repaid. So, for example, they could advance a business, you know, fifty thousand dollars, 
and you need to repay them $70,000, and you will make those repayments by surrendering, say, 6% of your receipts through the debit card, credit card terminal, every day until that 70,000 has been paid. Yeah, and I've seen this in real life in the not too distant past. And that was exactly the scenario. The business was really in trouble. So they went to one of these places and they borrowed, I don't know what it was, big numbers. So like you say, well, I'm borrowing 100,000, but you're gonna end up paying back 150 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And every day we are taking 6%, 10%, whatever it is of your actual cash coming in, not your profit, Right. But your cash coming in. So if you've got a business that has a 10% gross margin, which we talked about, that means 10% of the cash that comes in ends up being your profit. Well, I'm giving 10% of the, the total sales to this company. There is no profit now. And th that's, that's a recipe for disaster right there. Well, I, actually, Doug, it's even worse. Because don't forget, your cash receipts that come from that terminal include sales tax. Yeah, yeah. And so that percentage of the total receipts if you look at it as a percentage of your business's sales, it's actually a larger lump because the, the receipts are inflated yeah, by the Yeah, because here in tax. Ontario, we've got 13% HST. Yeah. So you sell something for a dollar, you collect a dollar 13. If I'm now giving 10% of a dollar 13, right. that's you know 11, more than 11 cents that I'm giving to my, my financier and my total profit, my gross profit's only 10%. So I'm actually dipping in, well, I'm losing money yeah. on, a, on, a, on a cash flow basis. So. Uh, I take it you're not a, a not a big fan of those. So, and you know, and once someone once an individual starts getting a payday loan, it's almost impossible to recover. Once you get one of these merchant cash advances, unless the business is on a huge growth curve and is very profitable, I would guess it's kind of difficult to recover there as well. Well, you know, it's funny because I had a conversation with a gentleman down in Massachusetts who is a, a debt workout specialist down there. And he said that when he gets clients that are into these merchant cash advances, they end up with multiple of them. Yeah, exactly. By the time they meet him. And I think you've said that about these yeah, payday loans Yeah, that's exactly too. the same. If you look at my clients who have a payday loan, on average, they have more than three of them. Yeah. They don't just have one. That's just that's just the way it works. So, so okay. So, I got 50 other questions to ask you, but we're, we're going to have to have you come back next time you're in town and, and go through all the rest of them. Because um, you're based in what province are you based I'm in? I'm based in Moncton. Moncton. In Moncton, That's New not Brunswick. A, yep. And, and work with people all over Canada and the U.S. That's why it was 1,700 kilometers for you to get here. Yeah. So what are one or two debt traps that we haven't already talked about that... Uh, somebody should be aware of when they're buying a business. I mean, we talked about merchant cash advances and, you know, what are some other things that are, are obvious warning signs that you should be watching out for? Well, you know, the, the biggest one that I consistently see over and over again is the overcommitment of cash flow to debt repayment. Uh, people will consistently undervalue their own labor. That seller's discretionary earnings figure includes your compensation for working full time in the business, and so in the case of the the restaurant, we were saying it had a um, I forget what the number was a hundred thousand dollars of cash flow. You have to work full time to get mm -hmm. that hundred thousand dollars of cash flow. So if somebody were to commit, you know, fifty thousand dollars a year to debt service, then they're going to be left if the business just goes flat then all of a sudden they've committed 50,000 to debt service out of the other 50 they got to pay themselves support their family replace equipment that breaks and pay the income taxes that are owed on the business's activity yep. and what ends up happening is you end up with this person who realizes after a couple of years that they've because of the deal they've struck they've ended up indenturing themselves almost to the seller you know they're working really hard all the time um, you know, and it, it makes me think of, you know, in history, you know, people trading years of their labor for a ticket, you know, to the new world kind yeah, of thing. Sadly, we still do that in the, the way you're describing it. And yeah, the, the first few years of a business, and I know this for a fact, having started this business, the first few years, in our case, we weren't making anything. Mm -hmm. We went from jobs at big accounting firms making, I don't know what we were making back then, but tens of thousands of dollars a year to making essentially nothing. And if all your cash flow is going to debt repayment, this is something that gets human beings individually individuals into the same kind of trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, I've bought that house and now I got this huge mortgage payment and so I can't go anywhere or do anything. It's it's too much debt repayment. So you want to look at the life cycle and try to match the debt repayment to right. the life cycle then. Yeah. So, and, and oftentimes what will happen is when you get into a business, people will bring a homeowner mentality into the business. So, you know, I wouldn't like to have a loan to buy a color television. I, I think that would be a, an unwise decision. 
in a business, people will bring the same level of debt averseness into the business. They'll want to pay off their debts quickly. But the reality is, is that if you're going to buy, you know, a deep frying machine for your restaurant and that thing is going to be more efficient than the old one, it's going to recycle oil for you and, and all this kind of thing, and it's going to last a decade, what makes sense is to pay for it over a decade through a lease or a loan that's going to last that long so that you have more freedom with your free cash flow to deal with the problems, the emergencies. So, you know, the, the in my opinion, the place where it makes sense to have the debt in the business is where you have long-term capital assets that are gonna last for a long time. You try to get your institutional debt to be a part of that. If you're in a business where you have to carry inventory or you have receivables because clients pay you after 30 days, then you wanna have some, you know, maybe a line of credit to support that, but you have to keep an eye on it. That line of credit needs to be there to finance receivables if you start to have losses month after month and you're using the line of credit to finance the losses, well, now you've lost control of the business. And a lot of it comes down to discipline and having the tools in place so that you get your books reconciled every month and you can actually see what's happening in your business so that you don't get into those problems. Yeah, and I'm a big believer, I'm biased obviously, but I say if you're starting a business, you need an accountant and you need a lawyer. I and mean, certainly if you're setting up a corporation, that's kind mm -hmm. of important. But And what you want to do, even though you don't have a whole lot of money at the start, is pay them a few bucks just to get you set up. So I need to have some kind of accounting system, even if it's a relatively simple business. Mm -hmm. I'm a landscaper. I you know cut people's lawns. It's not really complicated, not a whole lot of inventory. You still need to understand um, what your installment payment requirements are. How does payroll taxes work? What about WSIB and EHT and all these other things? You know, setting up a proper chart of accounts is something that is lacking in a lot of businesses. I often see businesses where in their internal QuickBooks or what have you, they might have seven or eight different lines for revenue of the different services or things that they sell, and they have one cost of goods sold line. Yeah, And so there, it's impossible to actually determine if they're getting the proper gross margins on their different lines. And they could be doing something they're losing money on, they don't even know. Yeah, so it's better to set that up correctly because otherwise you end up with you know obvious mistakes. We talked about mm -hmm. mismatch, mis mismatching debt to the underlying asset. And I mean, if the deep fryer is gonna last for 10 years, okay, maybe you finance it over five, but you're not gonna be financing it with a line of credit that has to be you know revolving, paid off really quickly. That probably doesn't make sense, so. And you don't wanna take cash that you may need to finance a dip in sales in January every year. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to leave your business because then it leaves you vulnerable and that's when those merchant cash advance guys are calling. That was my conversation with David Barnett in March. It is now June 9th and David is back with me today, obviously over Zoom for those of you who are watching on YouTube. David is in Moncton, New Brunswick at the moment. David, thanks for popping back in what has changed since you and I last chatted in March with respect to COVID and what's happening with business buying and selling and, and all that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, as you can imagine, the, the pandemic has had an effect on, on people that were doing deals. When the, when the pandemic first came out, there was a, a rush for people to try to close deals that had been in the works. Um, however, you know, obviously businesses that were closed by government mandate, people were kind of like, whoa, what do I do? In, in the time since, as things have started to unfold, I can tell you that, you know, people who own a business that had decided they wanted to sell their business, maybe at the beginning of the year, if those people don't need to sell, they're, they're withdrawing from the market because they realize this isn't the best set of circumstances to try to be selling a business in. But there are still people out there who need to sell a business because of their cir personal circumstances. And there are people out there who still want to buy because they believe the whole COVID thing will come to an end and these businesses that were prosperous will be prosperous again. And so it leads then to the question, you know, what do you do with a business that maybe has suffered a decline in its sales? Because the best, uh, you know, indicator of performance we have, of course, is the past performance. So a business that might've been a good, solid, profitable business in 2019, maybe has suffered a 30% drop in sales. For example, if they're allowed to still be open, what do you do? And so what people have been doing, and, and it's interesting to watch how the market reacts, is people are still making deals for these businesses. And they're still basically making prices based on the past performance. But what they're doing increasingly is they're making part of the payment of that agreed upon price contingent upon a return to the normal level of business that was there before. So just as an example, maybe, you know, a business that might have sold for $300,000 before 
with a fifty or sixty thousand dollar seller note. Now the buyer is saying, "I want you to hold a hundred and twenty thousand dollar seller note, and I'm only going to start to make the payments on that note when the monthly sales get back to the average 2019 monthly sales." So basically, the seller is being asked to finance, you know, usually the the part of the purchase that goes beyond the value of the tangible assets, and they're tying the commencement of those payments to an actual return to normal business conditions that we saw before. It's, it's almost like the, you know, at any time you own a business, you bear the risk of future performance. The sellers are continuing to bear the risk of future performance under these kinds of deals. And I, and I think, you know, for <clears throat> the purpose of your broadcast, you know, you talk about debt. I think it really highlights, you know, how debt can behave very differently depending on who holds the debt. And when you're buying a business, if the seller holds the note, you can basically come up with any sort of agreement that you both agree upon that makes sense. And in some instances, you know, if a business never does recover, it could mean that that note never ever gets paid. And so effectively the buyer ends up with a discount because the business never turned out to be as good as it once was. Yeah. So we're in a much riskier environment is, is what it, what it comes down to due to the massive uncertainty that's out there. It will exactly. And, and for sellers, who know that they need to sell, there actually is an imperative. There's a reason to get the deal done now because if the end of 2020 arrives, well, then they actually have a full year of performance now suddenly on the books at this lower level. A buyer that looks at a business in 2021, no matter how well it performed in 2019, is going to take those 2020 results into account. Really, if someone doesn't sell now, if they want to get a value that they would have achieved before the pandemic, they're going to have to wait until after 2021 so that they can show that 2020 was really an aberration in the normal, you know, historical performance of the business. Yeah. And it's a tough call because you're right. We talked about in the main body of the show that a business is based on the value of a business is based on what it generates. So you typically take a look at, well, there's last year's financial statements. This is how much it generates. We apply the multiple. That's what we're willing to pay. Well, what happened in 2019 is in no way representative in most businesses of what's happened in 2020. So either I want to get the deal done now before the full year's results are in, or if I wait a year, ooh, it could be, could be a lot worse. So it's difficult times for people who are both buying and selling business. If I'm buying a business, just like buying a house, I'm waiting. I'm not jumping into anything right now. On the other hand, if I'm selling, I kind of want to get it done sooner rather than later. So, mm. well, that, that's a, a, a very good quick update on what has been happening. Can you let everyone know how people can track you down? What's the website? What's the best way to find you? Because as we talked about at the start of the show, you advise people who are buying and selling businesses. This is a time where having some expert advice would probably be, be very valuable. So how can people track you down? Yeah, the, the easiest way to reach me is at my blog site, davidcbarnett.com. And you can find my contact info there and you can sign up for my email list if you wish. And there's access there to all the playlists of videos. I've got about 500 videos, I think, all about buying, selling, managing, and financing small and medium-sized businesses, all driven by questions from viewers and over the course of the years. And so if this stuff interests you, please come on over and, and help yourself. There's a ton of resources there for you. Fantastic. And a ton of stuff on YouTube as well, which again is linked to through davidcbarnett.com. Uh, David, thank you for jumping back in from uh, Moncton, New Brunswick to tell us what's happening. Thanks very much. I'm enjoying my haircut. We have, we have, <laughs> yeah. we have barbers now, Doug. Yeah, no, we, we do not. We're recording this on Tuesday, June the 9th, and we do not have barbers yet, as those watching can see. So, And unfortunately, I can't go to Moncton and get a cut because, of course, the borders are all closed. We can't even, right. we can't even come in. So, I don't want you bringing your germs. No, I don't understand. I, I totally get it. So hopefully the next time we speak or see each other, uh, we, we both have, have been freshly shorn. So we shall see. David, thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Doug. Have a great, great day. Thank you. That was David Barnett, and that was our show for today. Thanks for watching and listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. <laughs>